Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with Robin Dunbar, who is an emeritus professor of evolutionary psychology and biology, uh, and also the author of, uh, gosh, countless books, um, a couple of which I have with me here. Uh, there's this Introduction to Evolution, um, which I think in the UK is called Human Evolution, the Pelican Introduction. In the US, it's called um, Human Evolution, Our Brains and Behavior. Th- there's another book, I think it's kind of like a textbook, Evolution, What Everyone Needs to Know. Um, there's this one, Grooming Gossip and the Evolution of, of Language. There's the, the science of, of love. There's the trouble with science, the evolution of culture. How many friends does one uh, need? Um, and then uh, the most recent books include this book on, on friendship, this book on religion, and a book on what we might call Darwinian management. <laughs> it co-authored. It's called uh, The Social Brain. Welcome, Robin. Great pleasure to be here. Now, in the last couple of books, the one on friendship and the one on religion, I mean, these are two things which, um, interestingly, we've discovered have a big impact on well-being, and, and not just subjective well-being, but we can actually measure objectively things like life expectancy, right? And if people don't have good, solid dense social networks, if they lack friends, they die young. And we've also discovered that religion has an impact on one's life expectancy. And and so um, presumably both of these things have some kind of, of fitness benefit. Uh, and uh, if we go back and look at our ancestral past, um, there's probably a, a good reason why uh, things like friendship and evolution evolved. And in this latest book, you talk about how companies and organizations can harness these insights in order to help individuals flourish and to help these small groups <laughs> known as companies and organizations to, to flourish. So I guess one question I would have is, why are these topics of friendship and, and religion only getting the kind of scientific attention that they're getting now um and and why haven't they always been given this kind of scientific attention well i I guess to be fair they really have been given um quite a lot of attention over the years particularly religion i mean the victorians were terribly interested in the kind of evolutionary history of religions why why we have the religions uh we have today when these are actually quite clearly not very old. I mean, we know most of the big world religions as we have them. We know exactly when they were founded and who by, you know, Christianity by Jesus Christ, Islam by the prophet Muhammad, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, who founded Sikhism in the, whatever it was, 13th, 14th century or something like that in India. Um, Buddhism founded by the Gautama Buddha uh, and so on and so forth. So, so we know when those, you know, but, Nonetheless, everybody was kind of clear that religions existed before they turned up. Well, they tell us so, because they're telling us they're bringing us a better religion than the one that was there before. So, you know, there's been a long history of that. Less so, I think, probably true of friendships. It's only really probably, dare I say it, in the hippie 60s that people started to get interested in psychology and friendships. But yes, you're right, there's a sort of... Um, downturn, I suspect, is what happened during the kind of 80s and 90s when people got a bit, um, didn't seem to be making much headway on on either of these and I think kind of gave up. Evolution definitely um, uh, um, was viewed as a not very interesting topic in anthropology, for example, through the um, 90s, uh, 80s, 90s, and the 2000s. And in fact, a paper I sent to a, a mainstream anthropology journal only about a couple of months ago was sent back to me saying they didn't do religion. You know, like, oh, that's the centerpiece of anthropology, for goodness sakes. For a hundred years, that, that that's the main topic. So anyway, there you go. So I think it's true that um, 
uh, they kind of had faded in terms of interest. And I think it was largely because people weren't making headway. But they weren't making headway, I think, because they were kind of asking in both cases the wrong kinds of questions. They, they were seeing um, friendships as sort of largely very, very small scale. You know, you and your mum or, you know, you and your offspring um, or you and your best mate and you know it's a sort of dyadic the, the world of psychology social psychology is a sort of world of dyadic relationships and nothing beyond that forgetting that really our social world is quite large certainly a lot bigger than two or three people um and that larger size the social network within which we're embedded is actually crucially important and crucially important for us in many different ways and I think they sort of lost track of religion, kind of disappeared into, uh, I don't know, cognitive science of religion, I suppose, uh, which, which, you know, sort of has been modestly successful in the last couple of decades, but in some senses hasn't got anywhere. And forgetting the kind of lessons of the old 19th and early 20th century anthropologists that religions were to do with communities, you know, they were society, societal processes not just individual race so you know it's this shift more recently i think with to to religion as an individual thing you know why do you believe in in certain kinds of things and um i think it just misses the point again that you know religion is part of the fabric of most societies it's what you know plays an important role um now you alluded to the benefits of friendship and religion in this sense in terms of your health and well-being and even your longevity. And these have turned up um, out of the blue with with very serious numbers behind them. And there's a lot of argument, certainly I can remember, you know, maybe 20 years ago, people saying religion didn't actually benefit people, make them healthier. But I think more recently, the evidence is quite clear it does. Um, just to sort of revert back to the friendship component, in particular, the, the the last 15 years really has seen, maybe less even, a positive tsunami of uh, publications showing massive benefits from friendship. So the single most important factor affecting your uh, mental health and well-being, your physical health and well-being, and even how long you're go going to live into the future from today is the number and quality of friendships you have. And the optimal number seems to be about five. So this, you know, this data on heart attacks, uh, you know, um, whether you survive this uh, um, a year after your first heart attack or not, whether you um, um, are likely to develop um, uh, symptoms of depression. This is uh, a study I, I was involved in symptoms of depression in the next two years. So these are prospective analyses. These, these aren't sort of casual ratings. These are very hard nosed. And especially I really like the heart attack studies because you can't argue with it. You know, either you survived 12, that 12 months after the first heart attack or you didn't. It's as simple as that. Um, it's not a case of, well, I think I might have or I you know, think I liked it or what have you, which so many of these kind of rating scales are. This is very, very hard-nosed data. Um, we think we understand the glimmerings of why uh, that should, should work like that. Uh, and that is um, that the processes involved in establishing and creating friendships uh, involves the endorphin system in the brain. And this creates a sense of warmth and uh, relaxation and peacefulness um, and trustingness in the individuals we engage in these activities with and that the underpinnings, if you like, the pharmacological underpinnings of friendships. Uh, but it turns out that um, the endorphin system when it's activated in the brain, also triggers the immune system, and particularly the natural killer cells seem to be heavily involved. And the natural killer cells are specifically targeting uh, viruses and certain kinds of cancers, not all cancers, but certain kinds of cancers. So now we can kind of begin to see why there's the link. So I think it's just a bit more than your friends turning up with chicken broth when you're not feeling well and 
you know, behaving like good good neighbours. It's much more to do with the activities you do with them, um, day in day out with your friends, uh, triggering the endorphin system, and this having this byproduct in terms of health. Both friendship and and the study of religion had been um, of considerable interest. Then it died a death, uh, and it probably yeah. died a death because they sort of we're looking at it the wrong end of the telescope, but that um, in terms of the health benefits that you alluded to, these are very, very strong, especially so for, for friendships. And this is partly because, well, we kind of, I think, understand now how this works. It's because the endorphin system, which underpins friendships, um, triggers the yeah. um, immune system uh, when the brain is flooded with right. these. So, yeah, I'm going to ask you the evolutionary uh, reason for that, but let's let's go back and just start with religion. Okay, so here's where I'm going to resume. Now, it, it's kind of strange about religion um, because, um, you know, a lot of people are trying to figure out what makes humans unique, and so we oftentimes emphasize our capacity for reason, and that's what makes us different from the other primates. But But it seems like we could just as easily point to religion because we are the only religious primates, perhaps only the, the religious animals. So is, is it religion that makes us unique as, as humans in a way? Yeah. And if so, um, some people would attribute this to be something like a spandrel, sort of an evolutionary byproduct of some other attribute that we have, like um, theory of mind. Um, what's wrong with that argument? And why do we think it, must be some kind of fitness enhancing capacity. Okay. Um, I think it probably is fair to say that uh, of the things that distinguish humans from all other animals, birds, mammals, whatever, um, religion is certainly a key one. But I would probably want to argue that religion itself is derivative of something else um, that's more generally important that is actually storytelling it's the ability to story uh, tell stories as it were and stories are about um, thinking about and concocting tales about worlds that we don't can't physically see so if you like invisible worlds so um, uh, things that, you know, as in a sense of fiction, um, is the classic case. But all the kinds of many different kinds of stories we tell, fictional and, and even sort of um, factual stories about uh, places far away, and travellers' tales, uh, are all about things that we can't physically see. We have to imagine in our mind. And, and religion is, is sort of part and parcel of that spread. So clearly the ability to do that uh, um, uh, think about a hidden world, if you like, is, is essential for the production of religion. And that in turn, uh, this capacity in turn is derivative of um, mentalizing abilities, of which I guess the best known is, is formal theory of mind. Theory of mind is the ability to understand what somebody else is thinking. But, um, you know, children acquire that at the age five. And believe me, adults can do better. Um, so they can handle about five four other mind states as well as their own they, they're what's called fifth order intentional um, as opposed to second order intentional which is theory of mind uh, which is what five-year-old children um, develop or aspire to as it were along with great apes great apes seem to be able to manage that but nobody else c can do better than that um, and that it, it just seems to me that well a that allows us to get our noses off the grindstone of the world far enough to be able to ask, could the world be other than it is? Are, are there, in fact, other worlds that we could think about? Which is the basis, of course, of, of uh, science, uh, amongst many other things, but culture in the sense of creating fictional stories and so on, storytelling. But then, of course, it leads very directly into religion. You, it seems to me you can't have a social or communal religion unless you have fifth order intentionality, you have anything less than that. You can certainly have religion, uh, but it's kind of more personal. And I don't have to believe you, right? It's you, you and your army, um, if you want me to believe what, 
uh, this 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 stuff you're telling me. Whereas once you have fifth order religion, fifth order intentionality, it's possible for us to engage together and and believe uh, uh, both believe um, that that something to do with the spirit world or it is it is true. Um, seems to be a kind of Rubicon that you go through at that point. Um, so, so there is a sense in which religion, if you like, is a byproduct of our thinking ability, but at the same time, it's also part and parcel of a much wider toolkit we use for bonding groups. And this, if you like, is my pitch that that um, uh, religion is part and parcel of the toolkit that was evolved by our antecedent species to bond these very big groups they were trying to live in. So the, if you look at how primates bond their groups as the most intensely social of all mammals and birds, then they do it through a lot of social grooming. And, and grooming triggers the endorphin system. The endorphin system underpins this sense of trust and warmth towards each other individuals, creates these intensely bonded relationships. But because grooming is social grooming in this sense, is a very um, intense, emotionally intense, but also very intimate activity. There's a limit on how many, how big a group you can bond that way. And that limit seems to be at about 50 um, individuals. And we still use you know, physical contact, what's called soft touch in the literature these days, usually, um, all the time with our nearest and dearest um, uh, uh, friends and family as part of the process of social interaction during the course of conversation. You're, you're constantly, you know, stroking their arm or patting their shoulder or these kind of things. And we just do it unconsciously. And this is doing the same job as social grooming. It's triggering this highly specialized neural system um, that responds only to light, slow stroking. But the problem is it'll only sort of allow you to bond groups of 50 and, and and interestingly enough that seems to be about the furthest limit out at which we tolerate this kind of touched based interaction that seems from the surveys we've done you you kind of draw the line round about your cousins uh, and your better friends um and that that'll take you out to about uh, about 50 people only, which is exactly the same limit as you see in, in primates beyond that it's handshakes only, you know, I'm, I'm letting you come mm. a little close, but you're not coming any closer than, than, than a handshake. It, it may depend on whether you're in Italy or in uh, Denmark, right? No, it doesn't. <laughs> that's, that's the surprising no. thing. We've done surveys up and down the length and breadth of Europe, and the most touchy-feely in Europe are the Finns of all people. Mm. Um, believe it or not, and, and the, the, you know, um, more touchy feely than the Italians. Um, but we've also done it in Japan as well, and and the patterns are very, very similar. Um, uh, the the you know whereabouts or how much of the body is permissible to touch correlates with the emotional closeness of the relationship you have with the person, and this with this very clear line uh, around that inner circle of about fifty people. Um, but the problem is when our deep ancestors in the course of evolution were trying to expand out onto the savannas from the, the, the safety of the forests, um, they were needing to increase their group sizes because essentially group sizes providing you protection against predators, right? Um, and this caused, you know, this caused them not, not a little problem, uh, I think is probably the best way to put it. Um, because if they couldn't um, bond these larger groups, the groups would constantly dissipate under the kind of centrifugal forces that tend to um, drive individuals apart when they're living in groups. And these are very, very strong forces. Um, something is needed to overcome them. And what seems to happen is we discovered progressively over the last couple of million years other ways of triggering the endorphin system that did not involve direct physical touch so we were able to kind of do virtual grooming and that meant you could groom with several people simultaneously and if you don't believe me uh, i can merely recommend that you go and try cuddling two people simultaneously in the back row of the cinema because i'll bet you one of them will leave in a huff uh, after about 10 minutes because you're not giving them enough attention you're paying far too much attention to the other person 
right? Um, and if you try and split your time more evenly between them, neither will be happy. <laughs> Um, so, so the, the, you know, it's this limitation with with this touch base bonding mechanism uh, that sort of forced our ancestors to, to to discover really. And some of them, I mean, there's only one of them which is a genetically uh, uh, created mechanism, and that's laughter. And laughter we share with the great apes, but that that seems to be very very ancient. Um, but there's some tweaking gone on there genetically that allows it to be very efficient for triggering the endorphin system. But the others, which which all really date back to the archaic humans within the last 500,000 years, um, are things like singing and dancing, um, uh, the rituals of religion as the thing we're interested in right now, feasting together, eating together socially, mm and uh, um, emotional storytelling and storytelling in general, but particularly emotional storytelling. And we've shown that all of these trigger the endorphin system. All of them enhance the sense of bonding to the individuals with whom you're doing it. So if your best friends are not there on the day when you're dancing on the tabletops uh, in your local <laughs> Greek <laughs> um, uh, uh, restaurant, <laughs> Um, it, it doesn't affect the, your relationship one iota uh, to even your best friend if they're not there. But a complete stranger, you'll come away after a, 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 an hour's kind of singing, um, uh, uh, communal singing with them, feeling you've known them since you were in primary school. Yeah, it's absolutely extraordinary. We, we always refer to singing as the icebreaker effect because our experiments show you can take complete strangers and turn them into people who've, think they've known each other since childhood they're telling each other their life stories and all their secrets as it were, uh, in a way which nothing else really does um, but it's interesting in this context that religion has a similar sort of effect because we, we your social network consists of a series of layers of individuals a very small number of very close friends what we call the shoulders to cry on friends who are your kind of emotional and social and other kinds of support that you'd go to in times of trouble um, and then going out through less and less close friendships as it were layers of less and less emotionally close friendships um, uh, but people you know if you ask people you know who would you go to in times of great trouble your life fell apart you know consistently time after time after time the number comes out at about five the average so you know some variation there are terribly social people like you greg you know who perhaps have 10 people and there's terribly antisocial people like me who might have only zero one person they do that with but the average is absolutely consistently five and we, we have many many uh, surveys and studies showing that people who go to a religious service every day, 365 days a year, very often list the entire congregation. They, they'll list as many as 80 people. And you go, there's no way you could have 80 shoulders to cry on friends in real life. But they feel mm -hmm. as though they have. It's that sense that we all belong, we're all family, that, that engaging in the rituals of religion do. And, and, and you know, do, going, to, going to church, for example, or whatever it may be, mosque or, you know, uh, temple or whatever once a week doesn't really hack it you still only end up with about five good friends but 365 days a, times a year or more um then then you really feel com intensely bonded it's because you know of all the the way the rituals we use in in religion the singing the adopting of somewhat stressful um uh, poses as in kneeling to pray or whatever it may be um prostrating yourself on, on on the floor and particularly when you're doing it in synchrony and everybody's standing up and sitting down or kneeling at the same time and obviously singing together some religions or some sects even laughing together <laughs> um uh, dancing together all these things going on listening to emotionally uh, sob stories in sermons uh, 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 and, and so on all these things create this intense emotional upwelling um, that in the limit you know can actually if it's pushed far enough will actually push you into trance and that's the issue of where religion originally came from I think because I think oh, if you look all the 
kind of small scale hunter gatherer societies, they don't have gods, they don't have a concept of heaven and hell, they don't have a concept of the soul, really. Um, certainly not one that sort of has, has a, a plus and minus account being drawn up that, you know, you present to St. Peter at the gates of <laughs> the pearly gates when you get there. Um, you know, they don't have priests, they don't have temples, they, they, all these kind of things. They're much simpler religions. They're animist in that there are, is a spirit world and, and there are spirits of various kinds which inhabit everything we look at, the trees, the mountains, the, the lakes and all these kind of things are associated with the spirit world. Uh, but you can go, what they do know is you can go and visit the spirit world through engaging in trance. And so they, you know, engage in trance dances to produce it or they take funny substances that will, you know, sort of do it the hard way, if you like, a sledgehammer version. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, what that seems to do is lift you into a completely new plane of consciousness, as it were, which is very characteristic of all the mystics. So if you look at the entire list, you know, history of mysticism within Christianity, within Islam, within Buddhism, within Hinduism, Sikhism, you name it, they all have a mystical tradition associated with them. They don't always like it. So mainstream Islam does not like the Sufis, who are the mystical <laughs> branch of Islam. Um, but what they all they all describe it in the same way. You, you seem to connect in some way with the divine mind, uh, it's expressed slightly differently, maybe according to the local theology of the religion. But essentially, they're saying the same thing. You have this extraordinary sense of um, being taken out of this world and, and sort of melded into um, the divine principle that sits behind the universe. Um, uh, uh, you see, it's sort of you know, how Buddhism works in in this kind of sense of, of with its reincarnation, as it were, uh, process. Um, and so that's a very real experience. And I, we we kind of now think that this is produced by intense intense levels of endorphin activation in the brain, which you can either do the kind of sledgehammer way with drugs or as the hippies <laughs> discovered in the 60s. Uh, we are both old enough to remember, <laughs> except if you can remember the 60s, Greg, you weren't there. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, you know, or, or, or by trance dancing, or you can do it in the kind of much more sophisticated way that the yogis and, and, and Buddhism and many of the Eastern religions do, which is through breath control and breath control which is what you're doing when you sing. It's intensely hard work mm -hmm. for the for the lungs and the diaphragm and so on, um, singing. But any kind of breath control is such hard work, it actually triggers uh, uh, an endorphin hit and you can trigger yourself in, into um, into a, a trance state um, in, a, in, a much, in, a, in a much calmer, more sophisticated sort of way. And it's very relaxing. I mean, it's clear that if, if, if you talk to the people who work on hunter-gatherers, generally speaking, they, they will tell you that, you know, the, these kind of trance dances are not a regular Sunday service issue. They're quite irregular. It's unpredictable when it's going to happen. But what that tends to happen is as relationships within the group that live together, a group of people that live together, starts to get fractious um, through the usual stresses of living with folk, um, uh, somebody will say, oh, it's time we had a, look, the moon is uh, very full. It's time we had a trance dance because the moon is irrelevant. It's just kind of an excuse, as it were. What they're trying to do is is get everybody together, have a trance dance. Trance, the, the trance effects seems to reboot everybody's computer and re restore um, relationships within the group to a sort of equitable sort of level. And then, you know, gradually over the following weeks, things fall apart and a uh, month or so time, you know, somebody says, oh, it's, it's time we had another trance dance. And so this cycle goes on, but it's extremely intense. Um, and, and, you know, they, it, it's very often, they, Hunter Gatherers often describe it as a very frightening experience, but it's absolutely beautiful and warm and it creates this sense of warmth and stuff if you can survive it because you... You know, you have to survive the ogres in the spirit world when you go into the spirit world. And, and so it's actually quite a frightening experience. For them. But, you know, they, they, it, it, 
you know, they actually find it at the same time very pleasurable, it seems. And, you know, it really seems to work in kind of restoring this sort of social balance of the group and allowing the group to stay together. And that's the big problem that we have. All the primates have this problem on a relatively small scale. And grooming is the solution to that, um, grooming based alliances. We have it on a mega scale. And, you know, we have, have had to find these various ways, um, like having feasts, like having Saturday night bops, <laughs> dances, uh, communal sing songs around the campfire and so on, and, and the rituals of religion to try and create this sense of belonging and bonding, which will keep, keep the group together. If you can't keep the group together, you're in trouble in, in fitness terms. The world, you know, the predators will get you or if the predators don't. You know the folks in the next door valley probably will. Um, so it's it's these it's this need to create a bonded group. And this this is kind of not um, it's, it's it's just part of standard Darwinian <clears throat> evolutionary theory that sort of I think just got overlooked um, as much as anything in the past because everybody's tend to be focused on what's the benefit for you in the short term. You know your, re your successful reproduction. You know. Um, can you survive? Can you uh, have offspring? Can you get your offspring into adulthood? And what's been kind of just pushed to the back burner and uh, forgotten about is the fact that for these very intensely social species, like the anthropoid primates in particular, and therefore especially us, but also some of the other um, highly social birds and mammals, so the you know the horse family, um, the, the elephants, the dolphins, the camels, the camel family in particular. It was a big shock to us to discover that they're kind of um, humped. <laughs> well, actually, not all the camels have humps, of course, but you know they're they're because of all the vicuña and, and and so on in South America. But you know here are these grumpy camel heads <laughs> as we normally see them, actually intensely social and it, it almost certainly underpinned by by the endorphin system in some way. But it's true of birds. Birds trigger the endorphin singing system. These very social uh, species by singing together, chorusing. It turns out somebody's just shown. <laughs> Um, it both bemused me and, and made me cheer at the same time because we now had had birds in, in the same fold, as it were. I could explain a lot of bird behaviour. But it, it's this need to, you know, the secret of these species, these social species success, has been bonded social groups. And, you know, that's the, been the secret of their evolutionary success. And therefore, trying to keep the group going so that it does its group level functions for you as an individual is kind of half of the story of your ability to leave uh, genes in, in future generations, leave descendants. Um, you know, you, you can't do it all on your own, <laughs> I'm afraid, is, is the answer. Um, well, as an evolutionist, I mean, part of your job is to focus on final causes and... Uh, show the relationship between kind of the final causes and, and the proximate causes. So, so part of the story is understanding how um, the endorphin system works and how grooming and singing yep. and dancing and rowing together make you feel good, right? And how, uh, you know, loneliness and social exclusion make you feel uh, terrible. But of course, feeling good and feel, feeling terrible, those are really more symptoms, right? And byproducts yeah. of... Yeah, that well, they're kind um, of proxy, proxy things that are mechanisms. fitness enhancing and fitness reducing, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so we know that these have these have real fitness outcomes, uh, both in humans, uh, but especially now in in um, primates and even in a number of other um, species. It's been shown with dolphins. It's been shown with horses, and a number of different primate species, chimpanzees and baboons, for example, that. So the more socially bonded females, that's say females with more social, with a bigger little sort of shoulders to cry on group. Um, not only you know do they um, uh, recover quicker from um, um, scrapes that they're in, you know, sort of uh, 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 
uh, anatomical damage from falling out of a tree or being uh, beaten up by somebody else. Their recovery rates are much quicker, but they have much higher fertility. Uh, their offspring survive better. Um, they produce more um, grandchildren, uh, and that really is the test case for, for for fitness. So I think that whole kind of industry that's grown up in only really the last decade in field studies of these very intensely social mammals that's produced this evidence, um, you know, is is you know the the key bit of evolutionary information that we needed. Now, of course, with humans, I mean, there are things that that don't change. We spent ninety nine percent of our evolutionary history in small bands, and so that's going to leave uh, an imprint on how we interact with the world. But a lot has changed, right? And in particular, we have built up these much more sophisticated social structures that have a, a much larger scale. And you talk about how the, the religions changed and they went from being more animistic to being more uh, doctrinal. But we have these large firms, large states, large communities. You talk about how they had to gather together for, for protection. Um, and, and so do can we, is our capacity to, is our capacity to, to scale our social organization matched by changes in our capacity to um, build friendships at bigger scale? Uh, n no, is the, is the blunt answer here. Um, the reason we've been able to do it is simply that we've exploited the mechanisms used for bonding. These turn up to scale, extremely, scale up extremely well, most of them. Um, <clears throat> so particularly things like singing uh, and dancing, uh, we, we've shown with singing that the, in, the endorphin hit you get and the consequent sense of bonding to the group actually is bigger <laughs> in a, uh, with the same individuals in a, a choir of 200 people than it is in a choir of 20 people. So there's a big scaling up effect. But a lot of these are really quite good. Storytelling, the rituals of religion in particular. You know, the problem with, with feasting, eating together, it's very difficult to sit, get more than four people around the campfire right. or four people around the, the um, picnic table or, or, or you know. Well, you we know. do have these, we do have these uh, super churches, right? Yes. And, you know, certainly when people go to Taylor Swift concerts or, uh, you know, Coachella, I mean, yeah. th it's certainly an experience that people yeah. cherish, yeah. right? That's right. And and you come out of those kind of experiences. <clears throat> I think it really has to be in in the flesh. I don't think televangelism quite carries uh, the same weighting uh, as a sort of, you know, sort of being there, being there in, in the flesh, as it were. But those kind of events do create this intense sense of belonging and, um, el you know, sort of elation. Um, uh, that's that's very engaging and really underpins uh, this capacity to create these big groups. The, the only problem is they're creating these relationships with complete strangers. So you never get to really know who these people are, as opposed to the people with whom you invest most of your social time on a day by day basis, where you know them personally, they know you personally, and, and you have this intense effect. But you have this kind of gloss of a friendship. Um, uh, it seems in these um, cases of, of these large type concert type venues or, or big churches or, or mega churches or anything else like that, that that has this capacity to trigger the endorphin system. And this is kind of well known to theatre um, producers who, who have this saying that people come in as individuals. No, sorry, I'll rephrase it. An audience comes in as individuals and goes out as a community if the play's worked. So if, if their emotions have been aroused, um, you know, they're, they're coming in and sort of carefully sort of trying to avoid <laughs> sitting on other people and trampling on their toes and not speaking to each other at least. Well, they might speak to each other in America, but they, you know, very not, not the done thing to speak to your neighbours in, in Britain, of course. But after, you know, you've had your heart strings rung by this dramatic play and um, as you go out, you're talking to complete strangers happily in the aisles as, as, as you go in the foyer. And it does seem to be a very real effect 
but the, the so it works in the capacity to create very big um, community sizes, so to take us beyond our natural grouping sizes of about a hundred to two hundred people, um, uh, uh, to kind of the size of tribes, which in small scale societies are somewhere between a thousand and two thousand people, and then beyond that, it's allowed us to scale up. But as you scale up further and further, the actual strength of the emotional relationships is much weaker and it's often based at that point on much simpler cues so a cultural element so you know the fact that we all uh, you know, wear the same kinds of clothes or we all do our hair in the same kinds of way or you know do our beards in the same kind of way so you can recognize that you belong to my tribe and indeed the language you speak itself is a marker of tribal identity even down to the level of dialect I mean, you can you know tell when somebody is from so from, from Georgia <laughs> not from Minnesota <laughs> at the moment they open their mouth um and you know on the uh, you know dialect is unbelievably fine scaled in, in in the British Isles you can tell where a person was born to within 20 miles 20 25 miles mm -hmm. the moment they open their mouth even though they've had years living elsewhere, try, trying to learn to speak like other people, where, whoever they're, they're then living with in some big city, you still carry these traces of dialect that you learnt as a, uh, when you were learning it. Well, I think it's mainly as a teenager, actually. But, you know, these, these kind of things kind of work as, they're not perfect and they're not very robust, so they can easily break down. Um, but they work to keep together surprisingly large things. There's no question, but the relig religion is the much the strongest of these. It creates this sense of family over very, very large scales with, with strangers. Um, but th this is a consequence. Th you know, these, these processes are less than 8,000 years old. You know, we know exactly when they started to happen. The first evidence for doctrinal religions is uh, from settlements in, 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 the, in the Near East um, at the end of the last ice age, when, when people shifted from being uh, hunter-gatherers to initially living in small villages, and then village sizes started to increase dramatically settlement sizes. So you know, within about four or 5,000 years ago, you went from tiny little villages of 50 people um, up to, you know, Chattelhuic and, and Jericho you know, with 10,000 or more people. And the other nice examples, a nice example down in Lake Titicaca in Bolivia um, that the archaeologists have unpacked where they show, uh, this is much, much later now, we're, we're, we're sort of only dealing with about 2,000 years ago, a switch from... Um, and they're settled agriculturists at this point, but a switch from village sizes of about 120 or 150, something of that order, um, over a very short time scale, a matter, a matter of a, a few, few hundred years, it, sh it shot up uh, f first to 400, and then um, religion kicks in, and you know the capital city, within a few hundred years after that, is 10,000 people. So religion is... It's a combination of religion, the alliance between religion and the civil authority, basically, but it's still underpinned by religion. Suddenly religion is able to get them over that hump. And you can see that in both the archaeological record and in the comparative data, eth ethnographic data, that, that religion kicks in round about a community, a settlement size of about 400. So it, it, what it seems to be is, is extremely efficient at dampening down the kinds of stresses that would normally cause those settlements of that size to just burst asunder and people kind of walk off and say, I'm not living with you anymore. LeBlanc, this, you know, you're a dreadful person. <laughs> um, and instead of that, you know, a bit of religion and, and uh, we're buddies, so uh, um, we, we'll stick it out. Well, and I you mean, can see that actually you're awesome. right. A hundred, hundred years ago, if you met someone from a neighboring town in England, you would recognize them immediately as uh, as as someone different. And in New Guinea, yeah. they might not even speak a comprehensible language if they were from Indeed a few so. miles away. Yeah. But now yeah. it's it's if you're American, for instance, it's almost impossible to know what part of the country someone's from. 
and people don't get their identity from their immediate parish or town. They get their identity from these much larger groups, right? Whether you're an American or a Catholic or a, yeah, a fan sure. of the uh, uh, yeah. San Francisco team, or you know, you went to UC Berkeley. So, um, but but it doesn't seem like quantity makes up for quality. Right. So if you if you have to choose between yeah. five yeah, yeah. solid, yeah. strong friends yeah. or a hundred sort of acquaintances, I mean, yeah. economically, it would it would seem like there's a trade off. But psychologically, there doesn't appear to be one. Um, well, it's not so much that there's a isn't a trade off. It's that our psych, we're still operating with a psychology that was designed to handle very, very small scale hunter gatherer type communities, which have been kind of there and evolved over, you know, by a better part of half a million years, I guess, from archaic humans onwards, the Neanderthals and Heidelberg folk. Um, uh, uh, what we've been able to do is to exploit that uh, same psychology to create this, in a, you might call it, at least for the sake of argument, a kind of false sense of belonging. Um, that you, you know, because it's all in your mind, of course, <laughs> you feel very positive towards these, these people. They, you know, they, they have the same decorations on their parkas or, you know, they decorate their weapons in the same way or whatever it may be, or their cooking pot, or they know the same stories as you. And it, it storytelling, and this is kind of a key component, I think, of religion, storytelling seems to play a very, very strong supplementary role in bonding communities, you know. So if we want to bond, um, you know, large scale communities of the kinds we have now, then, you know, one of those is sh having a shared history of, you know, that we are here, um, uh, not necessarily as the favored <laughs> <laughs> sons and daughters of, of God, but that we are here uh, because of a certain kind of history. You just think of the, the origins of, of you know, 99% of people in, in the US as, you know, migrants in, immigrants in, you know, since the 1600s. Um, most of them, you know, have this sense of going to the promised land, uh, uh, you know, and uh, escaping the w wicked pressures and oppressions uh, of the various European countries they came from so they can practice their particular religion or they can, you know, get on and do some farming because there's just no land left in Europe and we're trampled on as, as humble peasants. Um, you know, so that, that sense of triumph, if you like, of, of being able to solve some great problem seems to create an intense sense of belonging. Ah, oh, yes, this is our tribal history. So tribal histories don't necessarily have to be, or let's say tribes, don't necessarily have to be people who are particularly closely related. I mean, they can be, you know, can be a, a random collection of people from Georgia and Minnesota, and they can still have the same sense of belonging. And, you know, I think, you know, I've always been struck by, for example, things like pledging the allegiance and that you all do in school every morning. You know, and you think, oh, this is, you know, to have that done for the, throughout the whole uh, country, the whole of the U.S., you know, it's like a sort of massive, great collective ritual, religious ritual. It, mm -hmm. Of course, it, originally it was a kind of religious ritual. But, you know, whether, whether you have a religious component or not seems less important than the fact that you do those kind of um, things that, you know, somebody, you know, breeds the, the promise of, or what have you. And, and, you know, maybe you have somebody give a little talk or something um and maybe you sing sing something i don't know i don't uh, uh, necessarily know what what happens but i mean we used to have that here is a very simple 10 minute service in every school every morning it's been abandoned because it, they, they began to think it was impossible to do but it was it, it people people of my generation who went through that at school kind of look back on that with great uh, uh you know sort of um uh, misty eyes that actually that was kind of created this sense of belonging and you started the school day off like that and I think pledging the allegiance is very much in in that bracket so long may you keep it um, you know 
let everybody else wave their own flag for <laughs> the Stars and Stripes is the one you do it with and just creates that sense of who we are, why we're here, how we got to be here, what we triumphed over to get here. Um, and you think oh, that's exactly what all these big religious texts are about. You know, it's, uh, you have a founder, be it Mohammed. It seems it. like companies are the new tribes or or the new um, yes. cults, right? Because yes. we spend most of our time, or at least a big chunk of our time, working for a company. And some companies like Toyota, they actually had these um, singing and dancing <laughs> right? yeah. R- routines. Yeah. I, I don't think they, they still do that. But but how can managers um, leverage these insights uh, about um, our evolutionary psychology to build better organizations? I think this is what your latest project is, is all yeah. about, right? Yeah. Leveraging the social brain hypothesis in, in a managerial setting to create yeah. organizations where people have a sense of, of, of belonging. I mean, this seems yeah. to have implications for optimal team size, for yeah. the way in which you, you, you manage uh, meetings, uh, for the, the, the ways in which you can design corporate uh, rituals. Um, I mean, should every manager have a, a, a Darwinian uh, toolkit <laughs> that they can oh, use to supplement the, the more mechanistic view of, of how companies and, should be run? And, and even more important, they should have a copy of our book under their arm. You know? <laughs> um, but the pitch of that book, I mean, the whole point of that book, my two co-authors are both um, uh, business uh, uh, consultants. They have their own consultancy and, and they work with, you know, m- very, very big companies, uh, big international companies only, uh, and, and with senior management only, sort of C-suite level management um, only in training them. Um, so they've had, you know, a long um, uh, period of, uh, of doing so, so many, uh, well, decades actually of, of practice. Um, and th- what's interesting is that they had evolved ideas which turned out to be very similar to mine they came across my ideas and went oh look <laughs> that's the theory let's go and talk to him so eventually the outcome was this book but the pitch here is that you really need to see an organization and it doesn't matter whether it's a school a hospital a government department a business an insurance company uh you know a warehouse whatever um a, as a village it, as a, or as, well, yes, I tried football team, um, you know, and of course, this is precisely what football teams do. They do lots of kind of rituals and, you know, collective hugging and all this stuff on the pitch. To, or if they're, you know, they're doing rugby football, they do what the New Zealanders do, the All Blacks. They, you know, they have a war dance. Scares the devil out of, out of the opposition. But more importantly, it triggers this massive endorphin surge so they can take any amount of punishment <laughs> afterwards. And they're very bonded and they have, this is this tiny country, you know, uh, the the five million people and they have dominated world rugby uh, against much, much bigger countries for a hundred (laughs) years. It's, you know, if anybody else beats the All Blacks ever, this is a major triumph, you know, uh, because it just doesn't normally happen. And I, I put it down, a lot of it down to that sense of family that they create. And they do it in interesting ways. Every single new player who's inducted into the team is taken round the boardroom and shown all the photographs of uh, the previous teams going right back to the first team that came uh, to to play against um, Brit- Britain um, in about 1907, I think it was. And they are literally being introduced to their family. It's a very kind of Samoan, you know, type of, of uh, Maori type of, uh, of view, as it were. This is your family. This is your ancestors, you know, and it creates this intense sense of belonging, uh, which which helps. But, you know, I, by the same token, I always hark back to the kind of Victorian period, Edwardian period, sort of turn of the 19th, 20th century, um, founders of the big multinationals, of, as we have them, you know, the Unilevers, the Marses, the um, Cadburys, you know, Hershey's, no doubt, too. Um, you know, all these people, when they set their factories up, the one thing they did was put a social club on every factory floor. And in those days, a social club included not only somewhere to play cards or have, have a meal uh, um, or, or have dances, 
but tennis courts because everybody was into tennis. Yeah. Right. And the same. A lot of tech companies in Silicon Valley have have utilized the same insights to to build communities. Yeah. But But their whole sense was. If you this this the fact that there is this club there which is free to all members, the membership ticket is simply you work for the company, then it creates this sense of belonging uh, and and commitment to the company, and you have a much more productive, less fractured, less siloed um, uh, organization. And and um, you know this sort of goes back to the Japanese example you t- talked about. Um, of course, the, well, one might add, you know, the accountants throughout the tennis clubs, <laughs> mistakenly in I know, the 1950s, early 60s, and the sort of post-war restructuring of, you know, efficient, more efficient, um, financially more efficient organizations. That was one of the things that went. Um, but you kind of wonder, and the other example, as, as you mentioned, was the Japanese motor industry, you know, who every morning the entire factory did gymnastics together, you know, Tai Chi types gymnastics uh, in the car park you know actually most of them did it by their desks in fact in reality but you know you have these pictures of them doing it all together in the car park. and I actually you know that was a 10 minute or maybe a 15 minute uh, gentle workout but it triggered the endorphin system and it just made them feel part of the organization and and so you know it's very characteristic as even as late as the 80s when you you met people uh, from these factories, you know, they described themselves as a company man. You know, I am. You know, it's almost like belonging to a to a region. I am a Toyota man. I am a uh, whatever man. Um, and I'm sure a lot of that sense came from from this this very very simple exercise, which actually the Japanese started way back in the 1920s, apparently, uh, as a national thing. Um, but it created this sense of belonging and therefore greater willingness for people to, to you know, knuckle on, get on with the job and, uh, and do stuff for the sake of the company, the greater good, because everybody benefited. You know, it's not just just the, the rich bosses at the top, but uh, you, you get the trickle down benefits in, in, in your salary, too. So the, there is a sense in which trying to create this sense of village is probably hugely beneficial in in the efficiency with which an organization works and, and you know this has been noted by um, um uh, uh business uh, people over the years as you, you in fact mentioned a, a moment ago you know they've tried to sort of do this in various ways um introducing these kind of social things but th- there are some you know, yeah, we probably wouldn't do it with tennis courts these days because you know um, it's a specialist interest for most people probably. But there are things that do work, uh, you know, and that might be uh, acquire. Um, they seem to be extremely successful. Yeah, well, the, some some have yoga yoga rooms. I think Salesforce yeah. has a yoga room on every yeah. floor of their of their headquarters. Yeah. Yes. No. Yes. You know, it does. You know, I think you just the the point is and the point we make in the book is there is no uh, silver bullet that applies to every organization. You have to look at the particular local culture and think about what kind of works in that kind of environment. And given the fact that these days, you know, people have families they want to kids they want to get home to put to bed um and and you know other friends out, 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 out outside work as it were and so you've got to design it around around people's natural lives as we live them these days but there are lots of examples where this has happened and you know the what's important is both an activity be it singing be it i don't know it might be just i mean there are big companies that have uh you know just put a pub uh, in their foyers of their, their, their all their um, campuses, uh, and uh, you know, the people just dropped in for a quick beer on the way home after work, and and built up friendships and built up friendships. The point is across the departmental barriers, so you got to meet somebody from finance and discovered they aren't all horrid. You know, just you know, that when they're saying you know you can't have that on your expenses, it's not just because they're being mean. Um, you know, and you build up these. Uh, friendships across the divisions, which help to keep the, everything sort of motoring smoothly. But in addition to that, there is a sense in which there's a, a culture 
a, a, a company culture, as it were, in the sense of a company's story, plays a very important role. You know, we are who we are because uh, of our history. We have a certain history. You know, somebody started something in their garage. You know, the two of them fiddling around with bits of electronics or whatever they were doing. You know, and gradually they triumphed over the market, and and here we are now. Apple, <laughs> um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but also the sense that, you know, we are here to provide a service to the community. That seems to be very important. You know, successful businesses that last a long time, which sometimes have been called centennial organizations, are ones that view themselves, whatever they do, you know, whether it's providing a service or whether it's producing a, a product or, or whatever, um, you know, that we are here to provide a public good, a benefit to, to mm -hmm. you know, even if they have to buy it from us, uh, we are here to, to actually benefit the wider community. And that sense of, you know, uh, you know, when I'm pulling these levers uh, to produce a product, it, it's not just, you know, for some rich shareholders. Uh, it, it's actually because it's ultimately going to, to benefit wider society, seems to be very important in motivating people. I think that's the key issue. Well, look, I think there's, there's, it's pretty indisputable that secularism is on the rise. Religion has been on the decline in, in the West in particular. And there seems to be evidence that loneliness is on, on the rise and, and people have fewer deep friendships and, and bonds. Yes. Um, what's driving that? I mean, is that a product of just greater social complexity uh, and thus not something that's a choice of the individual? Or is it that individuals are somehow unaware of the connection between their social interactions and their, um, their subjective sense of, of well-being? I think it's mainly a problem of the high levels of mobility now uh, that we've been under for, well, really probably since the end of the Second World War. Um, people have always moved, but it's just become, you know, everybody does it now. Um, uh, and on a much... Now, of course, you don't have to move, right? I mean, no, no, you know, yes. it's, you, you get a better paying job in a different town, like you don't have to take it, right? <laughs> That's true. That's true. Um, but on the other hand, you know, um, people do like uh, opportunities and challenges and, 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 and bigger pay packets because they have, you know, benefits <laughs> that they can make use of. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I think there's just been much more mobility, partly forced on us by globalization of, of, of uh, businesses in some sense uh, and even government, you know, um, you know, in the old days. You know, government consisted of probably 50 people sitting in a dungeon in Washington, <laughs> D.C. somewhere doing everything that's necessary. Well, now you have to have tens of thousands of civil servants because the whole thing has got more complicated. And, and there are, you know, there are more things that have to be done. We have to look after the the roads and, and, and the street lighting and all these kind of things that we have to have these days. So that creates in itself um, the context in which, you know, your boss says, look, uh, we need somebody to go down to Wichita and manage the system down there. You know, would you like to go? Uh, um, uh, and so people are kind of moving much, much more, I think. And, and one consequence of that is uh, not only do you move as an, as a, as an adult, as it were, uh, an established adult with a family into a new environment somewhere. And, and these days very, very likely a different culture, uh, you know, so and I don't mean moving, moving from uh, Dakota to, to Florida. Uh, you know, I mean, moving from, I don't know, the far East or somewhere to, to California or, or the East coast of the U S or anywhere else as part of a, you know, big multinationals, shuffling around of its its staff um you know so you're arriving in a place where you know nobody uh, you've got a cultural learning steep learning curve to go through but also you don't know where to go now if you're if you come with family of course the family gives you some buffering against this because you've got you know a little enclave to retreat to uh, in the evening but if you come as a single individual 
then you know it takes you a long while to find out where to go. And I think this is a particular problem. This, this is what we notice here, but I think it's probably true everywhere in the, the, the industrialized world, is people, if you think of your sort of uh, growing up processes, as you go through life, your kind of friendships are handed to you on a plate. Your social world is handed to you on a plate. You know, first of it, it's, it's your parents, friends, and your, your extended family getting together. It's the kids in the street. You know, you get sent to school. Um, you know, you're put in a in a in a, a, a class or a year group, and you move together. So you've got this sort of ready-made community. You go off to uh, college somewhere. Uh, you don't know anybody, but you're put in a dorm together with a bunch of guys and, and, and you know, you've got a ready-made sort of community, if you like. And then suddenly your first job after college, you're moving to the other side of the country somewhere. You have no, particularly a big city, you have no idea where to go. Never mind where to go that's safe, but you just don't know where to go to meet people who might be kind of interested in you as a friend. In other words, people you share interests with who are going to be more likely to sort of gel with you, as it were, and, uh, and become friendly. And the only people you know are the people who work, you know, and as I said before, you know, come five o'clock, they've got things to do. <laughs> they've already got their lives um, uh, uh, well established and, and functioning. So they want to get home, put the kids to bed, read them stories, whatever you do in the evening, bath them, all these kind of things. You've got the lawn to mow, you've got, got, got the, um, some, some, some uh, um, basketball game to get to for the, with the local basketball uh, team that you want to watch, or whatever it may be, your friends. And so you're stuck. These kids are just stuck, and they, they, they don't know anybody. It's very, very difficult, and I think this has created this pandemic of loneliness that's been getting worse and worse and worse over the last 30 years, really. And this is seriously bad news for companies because, well, as they know well, you know, the, the result is, um, you know, the, the, these people are, uh, are, are, are not well protected against kind of um, uh, uh, in terms of mental um, um, it's not diseases, really, is it? It's, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, depression and things. Um, and if you get depressed, you're just more susceptible to physical illness. So they end up taking time off work. Uh, their working effort is lost to the, to the company. Their um, uh, uh, colleagues have to step up to the plate and do twice as much work to cover for them. Everybody is feeling the, the consequences. It costs companies billions, literally billions, um, every year. And they're desperately scrabbling around to try and find some way of doing it and doing sort of well being classes and things and paying expensive coaches to do these kind, kind of activities. And I just go, Actually, why are you spending all that money? It does, doesn't necessarily work. You know, uh, it's not creating friends. It's giving them a bit of a lift. Mm -hmm. It's like giving them a paracetamol, you know, an analgesic. <laughs> it, it, it turns the headache for, off for half an hour, but it's, it'll come back. What you want is to create an environment in which friendships within the organization can grow organically. And that you can do for next to nothing. It's just called, you know, uh, putting on a, a, a choir. People will turn up like right. crazy to do that, <laughs> to sing. Yeah, you, just, I mean, just, you cite the Gallup, you, you cite the Gallup poll. I, I also refer to this in my class on the workplace. Um, and uh, apparently the presence of a friend at work is one of the most powerful predictors of retention. Yes. And yes. We, we have a lot of churn at companies now and certainly at universities. I mean, at my university, every faculty member is trying to figure out how to get a pay, better pay package at a different university, right? And there's new faculty coming in and, uh, and, and, uh, old faculty What's, leaving. So and, long, Greg? And, <laughs> well, I mean, but in, in some sense, I, 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 I was, I felt, I felt closer to the people I worked with at, at a restaurant than yeah. I do right. at the yeah. university. So part of it's yeah. the nature of the work, but part of it's yes, also, yes. I think, the management, right? So do you think that companies and universities can create a, a competitive advantage by offering their place of employment as a venue for strong social bonds to form? And, and like you said, it doesn't yes. seem like it's that ex expensive to have more have more dinners, have more activities, have, have, have drinks. But it seems like a lot of managers are moving in the other direction where they're saying, 
oh no, we're not going to have a Christmas party. We're, we're not yes. going to have cocktails. We're not going to have lunches. Everybody, yep. you know, is, is free to do their own thing. And, yep. and is it because they, they, they don't understand the importance of it or is it because they're focused on the budget? Right? Oh, these lunches, they're expensive. We can't do that. Yeah, well, also, you know, Christmas parties got a very bad reputation for bad behavior. So, you know, you can understand why they eventually kind of shut them down. Um, but I think in a way, you know, that was well-intentioned. And I'm sure when that tradition of having Christmas parties really got going, you know, it was with the good intention of trying to create a kind of bonded community in some way. But it's just unfortunate the way it was done, or maybe it was just the culture of the times um, that, that, that produced this. Um, because, you know, it failed to kind of pay attention to the fact that actually it's not just going out and getting drunk together that's important. It's actually kind of ha building an organic relationship with people uh, on a through regular interactions. So it's being able to meet up you know, sort of regularly once a week at some event, whether it's a yoga class or a, you know, a sort of choir practice of some kind or a sing-along. I don't, I don't, I'm not talking about kind of uh, BBC Philharmonic choirs here singing Bach cantatas. You know, I think talking about, you know, sort of round the campfire community singing the songs everybody knows, even if they're not very good at singing, will join in. Um, you know, it allows friendships to build up relationships which can span the point in many ways is they span departmental boundaries so you know you, you can make friends with with people in as i said before accounts or in sales or whatever it may be or if you're in university you know you can actually talk to i don't know chemists or maybe mathematicians and not just biologists or psychologists uh whichever department you live in um, but those kind of things need to be kind of curated carefully. I think they need to be thought through and not just um, thrown together. And I, you know, I, I have been known to, to um, suggest that actually, you know, the better value of HR departments is actually as the social facilitators rather than you know, the, the, the legalistic box stickers that they've become for better or for worse. You know, I mean, obviously you, you kind of need yeah. uh, 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 some sort of HR department that keeps all those kind of legalistic issues in line. Otherwise you risk falling apart, um, particularly these days. But, you know, there is a, a role for kind of um, human resources experts, which is actually kind of just, about building this sense of community and that's a much more of an engagement thing and, and you need people who are very good at you know uh doing that you know the 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 the, the, the good hostess as they used to say for a party you need somebody who can kind of get around and pull people together and get them all doing something or somebody who's bouncing yeah. and i don't know i don't know what oxford is like but i i i don't know what oxford's like but i remember you know before I joined academia, when I was young, I used to think, oh, they're always having dinner parties and cocktail parties and high table. And uh, in Berkeley, they probably are sitting around in hot tubs. And then I discovered yeah. that none of that is actually true because everybody is, oh, is so, just, well, uh, it, you know, working on their next paper. Yeah. No, this is Oxford <laughs> and Cambridge. This is the secret to Oxford and Cambridge because it's the collegiate system, right? So remember the colleges are not just dorms, Right in the in the sense that you would have them in America or, or halls of residence for students, they are communities that consist of the undergraduate students, the graduate students, and the faculty, and they all live in the college, as it were, or at least they all have rooms in the college, um, including the faculty, if, even if they're only teaching rooms. Um, but many of the younger faculty will actually live in on the same staircases as the undergraduates. So they're seeing each other every day. They're kind of eating in, in hall together. And there is this 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 regular cycle of dinners and stuff, um, uh, you know, sometimes very ritualized and, and, and formal. Um, but that's creating this sense of the bonding. And it does because the colleges are small. I mean, my college, Magdalen, which is one of the bigger ones only has 400 undergraduates. There's 200 graduate students and about 70 faculty. 
Um, you know, so the entire college uh, uh, consists of less than, um, what's that, 700 people. Um, uh, and, you know, it, I don't kind of teach, because uh, um, not all the faculty are necessarily teaching fellows, but the, the teaching fellows know the students. They know them all personally. They see them regularly every week. They see them in hall. They see them wandering around the college. They may, but both of them, faculty and students, belong to the same college societies, you know, whether it's the drama group or the rowing club or whatever. Um, so they're seeing each other and there is creates this very intense sense of bonding. And, and, and these, these are lifelong relationships. The attachment that most people have to their colleges is extraordinary. They, you know, come back every 10 years for a big celebratory dinner and stuff. Um, but it, 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 it only works because it is small. You have to remember Oxford and Cambridge are very peculiar in this sense. They're really federal universities. There is no university. There are colleges. You know, each college is an independent educational institution with its own charter, uh, establishing it as a separate thing. Uh, uh, but you, you know, the purpose of the university is simply to do it, set some examinations and <laughs> hand out some degrees. That's all. <laughs> of course, they build laboratories for you know, expensive th things. But you know, if, you, if you didn't have the sciences, if it was pure humanities, nothing would happen outside the colleges. All your teaching is still within the college. Even in the sciences, all your teaching is still within your college. Okay, lab classes would be at some central labs, but, um, you know, a lot of the face-to-face the -face teaching is, is done in with your college tutors, as it were. So it really establishes this very, very strong sense of bonding and commitment and it, it um, you know the, the work they have to do is very intense um, compared to most places and I think part of the secret to allowing them to do that is this sense of belonging and um, you know it's not to say uh, people don't get depressed and, 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 and what have you and or leave uh, because they can't uh, uh, hack it or they don't mm -hmm. end up fitting in but the, the loss rate is extremely low extremely low um, hardly any, you know, <laughs> in a cohort of a hundred undergraduates starting each year, uh, you know, you might lose one or two <laughs> before the end of the third year. Um, once they're there, they, they stay there. And yeah. I think it's just this intense sense of family that it creates. There's always pressure to increase cohort size, increase class size, increase group that's, size. That's, but yeah, as you pointed out, understanding optimal size is, Critical. I yeah. think one of the secrets yeah. to Amazon's success is their emphasis on on the two pizza team concept, yes, exactly. which has exactly so kept yeah. them agile. Yeah, yeah. But, but one I, of the questions I, I had, you know, you talked about you talked about how orchestras tend to cap out at a hundred, and yeah. you know, lots of organizations will uh, cap out at a particular size, and you draw these pictures of the concentric circles of increasing group size that you can be affiliated with. But it seems like people are affiliated with multiple groups simultaneously. So you could be a member of an orchestra yes, yes. that has a hundred and then yeah. you have your extended family over here, which, you know, has a certain size and they're, they're not overlapping. So one can be a part of, um, you know, humans at least can be parts yeah. of all of these different yes, organizations. And, yeah. and I guess I wonder, does, is there some kind of crowding out? I mean, when I think about the, the, the number of people that you can keep track of a typical person can probably name a thousand celebrities and a thousand football yeah. players and uh, you know, a thousand historical yeah. figures. I mean, d does the, the massive number of people that we know about in, in the news that we track our, 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 our celebrity people and our, all the Instagram followers, does, does all of that necessarily crowd out our, our capacity to have, stronger friendships and stronger relationships at more local scale? I don't think it necessarily crowds out the important relationships, which are the inner core relationships, as it were. What, what it does is just fill up these um, outer layers. So these, these layers of people you know run out to about 5,000, as far as we can figure out. The, there's a sort of outer limit on the number of faces you can say whether or not you've, you know, if you've yeah. shown a picture of somebody's face, whether or not you've ever seen them before. And that seems to, to you know, sort of define the difference between a stranger and a non-stranger, right? Um, and that seems to occur at about 5,000. So there's loads and loads of space 
out beyond um, even the um, uh, periphery of your tr your tribe, however you want to define that, um, uh, where all these uh, strange, weird people like celebrities and historical figures can sit. Um, and, you know, you would be able to say, you, you know, well, really, you don't know much seriously about them other than, you know, they recognize their, their face uh, uh, perhaps a few, few details, you, um, unless you study them, of course, as professionally. But, um, you know, the ones that are important to you are the inner core. And that really is um, the, the number that's known as Dunbar's number is 150 values. So it's varies somewhere between about 100 and 200 depending on who you are as an individual introverts will be somewhat smaller extroverts it will be somewhat bigger but the average is very consistently 150 across across populations uh even on facebook i'm delighted to see a very fine study that was published about 10 years ago on facebook in the proceedings of the national academy of sciences which uh, got a lot of flack, but the very useful statistic they give, having studied 61 million Facebook pages, is the average number of friends on these 61 million is 149. And believe me, on the strength of that as a prediction, <laughs> validation of a prediction of 150, I am going past go, collecting $200, and I'm buying an enormous yacht and going to live in the Caribbean. <laughs> Because uh, it doesn't often happen you get so, so, so close. Anyway, that number is really the core part that, that kind of motivates in your your social world. The, the layers beyond that, probably out to about 1,500, which in small-scale societies would be your tribe. Uh, but they're the kind of people you work with and the people you have sort of fairly regular dealings in some form with. But you kind of wouldn't invite them home. That's the big difference. The people inside the 150 circle... At some point, you would invite home, or you wouldn't mind if they turned up and knocked on your your, your door. But people outside that, uh, you know, you might go and have a beer with them after work. <laughs> then, under no circumstances are you going to let them inside your house, and they're definitely not coming to your big five o party. <laughs> so, so you know, there is well, lots of scope, but the quality of the friendships, you know, is 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 declining, in in and in, in therefore de declining both in the sense of the emotional warmth of the person but also your willingness to you know do favors for them and, and wanting to spend time with them you know you, um and and you know that that seems to be very important we've shown with telephone data cell phone data um and we had data from three countries britain italy and, and the us um uh, uh from an, an you know an, an actual formed community as it were because uh, all of them were academic communities so they, they they're all part of the same community and we, we have their telephone call records for a whole year and we sh we can show that when they meet a new person some a number appears out of the blue uh what happens is they spend a lot of time contacting them and presumably also they're doing that in the flesh as well um and then after about a month the rate of phone calling drops dramatically and so much so that we can predict w which layer of friendships the person will lie in mm -hmm. and how long the friendship will last before they stop calling completely just on the basis of the frequency of calling in that first month so what you're doing is sizing people up you know how well do they match up with me you know in terms of my interests and and the kinds of things that make a friendship for, for me and then you kind of get a good picture of them and you kind of anchor back put them in the slot where they belong <laughs> and um uh, um you know so it, it's and that's well within the 150 i mean you, you know you're not talking about um sort of handling bigger numbers than that. So it, it, it's actually quite small. But it's kind of interesting just going back, well, I, I just might add two things, one about religion. I think one of the problems we have, for better or for worse, depending on whether you think religion is a good thing or, 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 or not, um, but I think in the past, the benefit for relig of religion in communities would it provided a place for people to go to meet them, right? So you knew, you, you know, whatever your denomination was, or your particular sect or whatever, you could go along to their church, mosque, temple, whatever, uh, and you would meet like-minded people and you would have the opportunity then to embed very, very quickly. And of course, that's kind of 
um, been lost uh, for a lot of people um, in, in you know, the last 50 years of increasing secularization. Um, but it is sort of... Well, we, we didn't really... even talk about the seven pillars of friendship, but uh, yeah, now I it's... did learn why it is that when I go to somebody's house, I, I look at their bookshelves, and I used to look at their CD shelves. But, yes. but now with Kindles <laughs> and Spotify... <laughs> Uh, oh. It's a lot harder for me to figure out whether I'm going to be friends with somebody. <laughs> this is clearly a, a, a scam on the part of, uh, you know, the sort of uh, companies that sell us all this stuff to stop us really finding out who our friends are. <laughs> <laughs> right. You can't go and look at their bookshelves yeah. or their CD shelves anymore because it's hidden away inside a computer somewhere. <laughs> Well, Robin, thanks so much for joining me. The, the, the books are really fantastic. If you want to learn uh, about evolution more generally, definitely check out a bunch of books on that topic. If you want to learn about love, check out The Science of, of Love. And um, if you want to learn about friendship, and I have to say that both friendship, social brain, these are not just books to help you understand the world, but they're also in many ways kind of a how-to guide, how to forge better relationships and also how to run organizations which promote the kind of relationships that will help people to flourish. So thanks so much for, for joining me. A great pleasure, Greg, great pleasure. Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution 